This book has made me illiterate. What's up, everyone? Welcome to my channel. Today, we are talking about Don't Stick Your Dick in That, the book. No, that's, that's not the title. Today, we're talking about this terrible book about vampires sucking dick in the park. That's, that's also not the title. We're talking about With Teeth by Kevin Kangas. That's the one. This book was self-published by independent filmmaker and author Kevin Kangas in 2021. I want you to keep that year in mind as we go through this, because there will definitely be points where you're saying, there's no way this book was written any more recently than 1995. And not in a good way. The only official book description we get on Amazon and Goodreads is this. In the vein of 80s vampire films like Fright Night and The Lost Boys comes a new breed of vampire. In, in the vein of, get, get it because it's vampires. It's, it's witty. That's the book telling us how witty it is. But also, how very dare you desecrate the name of two of the most holy of holy vampire movies of the 80s by comparing this garbage-covered nightmare of a book to them. So you may ask, what is with teeth besides a hot dumpster fire? Before we get into that, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to like this video if you liked it, give it a comment, give it some interaction that lets the algorithm know it's okay to keep showing it to more people because I have this sneaking suspicion that the prudish YouTube gods are going to try to penalize me for the sheer number of times I am going to have to use the words dick and blowjob in this video. So also before we dive in, I want to give you a quick trigger warning for, oh god, everything? Misogyny death, mention of suicide, shaming of sex workers, ableism, slurs, so many slurs, rape jokes, and gratuitous pop culture references. Yep, I wrote that one down too. One of these things is not like the others. So like I hinted at up top, this book is broadly about two of the worst male characters you'll ever meet, who discover a group of female vampires who get their supply of blood by working as sex workers in the local park who only perform oral. Now, despite this sleazy, juvenile premise, I was willing to give this book a chance. I mean, I didn't know. It might have brought something new and worthwhile to the table or been exceptionally well-written, right? Uh... Sadly, no. So in the interest of not being entirely negative, I am going to start out with some extremely faint praise. It starts out with some kind of nice imagery, although we do get a run-on sentence here. From the road, the playground wasn't visible past the parking lot, at least not at night. Trees fenced the perimeter of the lot, curbing the moonlight and creating a barrier to most of the streetlights, so that someone not familiar with the area who was driving by might not even realize there was a park there if they didn't see the wooden sign made from a plank of wood so weathered it might have been found washed up on a beach. That's holy run-on sins. Letters had been lathe burned into it that read, Whispering Hills Park, open 9 a.m. to sunset. Cricket song trilled like an organic motor, precise and rhythmic, Lie your head in the grass and you'd fall asleep to it. So that's a pretty good start. It's, it doesn't continue this way. It does not continue this way at all. Any goodwill this book may have been building up with that passage is completely ruined on the next page. When we're thrown into the perspective of this redneck dude named Claude who is sitting in his pickup truck getting a sloppy blowjob from one of the vampire sex workers. She knows how to use her mouth like no girl he's ever been with. And then he thinks, certainly better than any truck stop whore I've ever mayonnaised. If you're tempted to stop reading this book right there, I don't blame you. I sure was. But I kept trucking through this. And by trucking through it, I discovered that these vampire sex workers are exclusively referred to as whores and hookers and the occasional slightly more polite prostitute. 2021, guys. 2021. 
keep that year in mind as we continue. So our redneck friend Claude here is not satisfied with just a blowjob. He wants full service. God help me. So this happens. Claude tangled his fingers in her hair and jerked and her head snapped up and she hissed at him. I don't fucking blame her. Her mouth was impossibly huge and like a lamprey filled with hundreds of needle sharp bloody teeth. So, uh, yeah, some, some kind of vampire sucking dick in the park. So Claude runs out of his truck and deeper into the park where of course he's set upon by this horde of vampire girls. And we get this passage. Then they were on him, ripping into him, tearing him apart. He felt clawed hands pushing into his guts as if he was nothing but a plastic bag full of blood. That's really gross. I mean, nice imagery, but ick. The pain burning and unreal and something bit into his neck. So hold on. Okay. So these vampires can bite your neck like regular ass vampires, but they choose to suck these crusty dudes dicks in the park to get their blood. What? What? So then we get into the main story with our actual main character named Guy, real original, and his best friend Ron, who is quite possibly the worst human ever. So Guy and Ron work in some sort of office building. No clue what their job is, except at one point Guy gets annoyed because it's not his job to help someone add cells together in an Excel spreadsheet. So whatever his job may be, it's not that. But at any rate, they work in some sort of generic office job where Ron constantly has these conversations that in the real world would most definitely get him reported to HR. Maybe not fired, but we could hope. And in this work inappropriate conversation, Ron tells Guy all about these vampires sucking dick in the park. I'm going to say this phrase so many times. You could turn it into a drinking game, but you might die by the end of this video, so I don't actually advise it. Guy thinks that Ron has probably been reported to HR before, but somehow he keeps skating by without getting fired. And then Guy has this thought about it. Classic Ron. He thought the world revolved around him, but somehow he stayed so likable that everyone wanted to be friends with him. He'd been Guy's best friend for nearly 15 years. Likeable. Like... Nowhere, nowhere in this goddamn book is Ron ever shown to be likable. Guy doesn't even appear to like him most of the time. Keep the year 2021 and Ron is likable in your mind as we continue through this shit show. Because I promise you, Ron is never likable anywhere in here. Fortunately, this book is short, 125 pages, but nowhere in those 125 pages do I ever like Ron one tiny, tiny bit. In fact, Ron. In the movie, Ron is going to be played by Ronald McDonald because he is a fucking clown. He's a clown. So Guy goes home to his wife, Joanna, who doesn't want to fuck him anymore, apparently, which I don't blame her. I wouldn't fuck this guy either. Like, boo-hoo, dude. You probably suck in bed anyway. So I guess keep that in mind as the impetus for why he would ever go get his dick sucked in the park by lamprey ill vampire sex workers. Because he does go to the park that night, but as soon as one of the women approaches him, he chickens out, says he was there for some other reason. I don't know. <laughs> no one cares. And then just peels out of there and goes home and pretends it didn't happen. He also fetishizes the shit out of this woman. Um, apparently she's very exotic looking and he keeps referring to her in his mind as an Indian goddess, and he does mean Native American, not from India. Indian? 2021, friends. So at work the next day, Ron is just being disgusting and talking literal shit. And Guy's inner monologue actually amuses me for a few passages here. If I pulled the fire alarm, he wondered, would Ron keep talking anyway? He suspected the answer was yes. Ron continues to be disgusting and Guy asks him, how did this conversation even start? And then thinks, and is there any way to make it end? So I do start to like Guy for just a split second here. And then a little farther down the page, he ruins any goodwill that I had building toward him by dropping the R slur on us. 
2021. 2021. So at home, Guy continues to whine and moan and bitch about not getting laid. And then after a few beers, he ends up going to the park again. Only this time he does talk to this woman, this exotic Indian goddess woman whose name is Cheyenne. And I had to look up how to pronounce that because I've never seen this spelling before, but Google tells me it should be Cheyenne. If it's not, I apologize. And Guy is absolutely terrible in his inner monologue, wondering how a woman this attractive can be a prostitute and she should be some rich man's trophy wife. Feminism, 2021. I hate this. I'm rage sweating. I hate this book so much. So Guy gets a blowjob from her this time instead of turning and running away. And things get really kind of porny for a little while, so I'm not going to read that to you. YouTube doesn't like that. But he wakes up in his car in an unfamiliar neighborhood a few hours later. I guess she sucked his dick so good that she sucked his memory right out of it because he has no memory of how he got there. He doesn't even think he paid her because... You know, sex workers just love sucking your dick so much that they don't need payment or something. I Ask Kevin Kangas, he wrote this shit. So then at work, Ron passes out. We don't know why yet, but it's from blood loss because, God, how, how much blood can you suck out of a dick without a guy noticing? I really, I need to, doctors, are there doctors watching this? Please tell me, please, please tell me. I, I hate that this book is making me ask these questions. Regardless, Ron passes out at work from blood loss and we get this passage, which frankly confuses me. Guy stood up and watched him go to make sure he stayed on his feet. He wondered if Ron's wife, Janie, knew he was having health issues. The bro code wouldn't allow Guy to call and ask her unless something extreme happened. But if Ron passed out again, then Guy would have to do something. Is that what the bro code is? Is that you allow your friend to pass out at work and have life-threatening health issues before you talk to his wife about it? Guys, is, is that the bro code? I, is that the bro code? Tell me. Tell me. So Guy goes back to the park. Cheyenne still doesn't want his money, but sucks him so good. Whatever. We get so many of these scenes. I don't care. No one cares. It's not graphic enough to qualify as porn, but it's porny enough that I probably can't read most of it on YouTube. So it's this weird middle ground and none of it is good. Pick, pick a side. Either be porn or be well written. I don't, there, there's well written porn out there, but this is not it. So Guy in his mind compares blowjobs between his wife, Joanne, and this girl, Cheyenne, Cheyenne and Joanne. Motherfucker, I just realized that. Anyway, Cheyenne swallows and Joanne doesn't. So, okay. I guess Cheyenne swallowed his ability to form memories because once again, he doesn't remember how he got home. So is memory contained in jizz? <laughs> is memory contained in jizz? The questions this book has me asking. I want to die. So Guy starts noticing these little needle-like teeth marks in his you know. So he goes to the doctor, which is mostly unremarkable. I think this scene might only be here so that we can find out that Guy doesn't know what a fleshlight is and is horrified at the thought of putting his dick in plastic sex toys or something. Because th the doctor asks him, are you using a plastic vagina or a fleshlight or anything? Guy was horrified at the thought of a plastic vagina no! Jesus! He shook his head again. What's a fleshlight? Are we to believe? Are we to believe? He's been friends with Ron for 15 years and Ron has never mentioned fleshlights. 
I find that highly unlikely, highly unlikely, sir. At work, Guy and Ron find out that this guy named Diggles, and yes, his name is Diggles. I'm not blowing past that one. Blowing. Diggles was the guy who originally told Ron about these vampire sex workers in the park. So presumably Diggles has been going to see them a lot and we find out Diggles has died of a heart attack. We're not going to find out why for a while, but I'll tell you right now, they surmise later on it's from blood loss from all the vampire blood dick sucking. This video was a bad idea. Anyway, Guy tries to show Ron some concern since he just passed out the other day and Ron makes a your wife joke instead of a your mom joke and I continue to hate Ron. And Guy is only like half a step down in my hatred. He started out a little lower down, like I hated him a little less, but I'm just hating him more and more as the book goes on, which I'm pretty sure probably is not the intention of the author, but it is what it is, I guess. And then out of nowhere, Ron continues a conversation they were having wherein he is incredulous that he doesn't have the right to roofie his own wife. He's so likable. Everyone wants to be friends with him. And Guy is only slightly annoyed by this. Instead of, you know, ending the friendship, telling Ron he's a terrible person, saying, yeah, marital rape is a crime and you shouldn't do that. I guess he did tell him that, but it didn't stick. Guy finds out that Diggle's wife took her own life I don't want to say suicide, but I don't want to rhyme either. Ugh. Took her own life a few weeks earlier. And even though the author makes a point to say that, he never connects it back up later on. Maybe the characters are just stupid and the reader is supposed to connect it, but later on Cheyenne gets really obsessed with Guy and suggests that they kill his wife Joanne. And nobody in the book makes the connection that this was the same vampire sex worker who was getting obsessed with Diggles as well. No one connects that maybe the wife's suicide was actually this obsessive vampire chick killing her or maybe Diggles killed her. It's never brought back. So I don't know if the author just forgot about it and dropped it by the wayside or if the characters are just morons. I don't know guys. I don't know. It's never brought back when it feels like it should be. So at Guy's house, Joanne has received this big fancy bouquet of flowers that he forgot that he had, had sent to her. And this is apparently all it takes to get her in the mood to fuck him. Because that's all it takes to get women in the mood, right? Flowers. Not, you know, paying attention to them fulfilling their needs, listening to them, talking to them, being a decent person. No, 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 none, none of that. None of that. Icky. Get that shit out of here. Flowers. Flowers make us want to fuck you. Who knew? Uh, apparently Kevin Kangas knew. So later that night, after Joanne has fallen asleep, Cheyenne shows up at the house and Guy is less than thrilled about this. He gets really shitty starts uh well yeah i'll just read it he couldn't believe it it was like she didn't get that showing up at the house of a stranger whose dick you'd suck twice was weird did she have some sort of mental short circuit he didn't know about that would be just his luck that he'd gotten sucked off by a mentally handicapped hooker the first and only time he'd ever gone to one are we supposed to like him is this supposed to be a character we identify with are we supposed to want him to live and be happy and thriving and the th 30 flirty and thriving <laughs> 30 flirty and thriving why the 30s are the best years of your life and then like i said earlier this is the part where cheyenne suggests they kill joanne because she just wants to be with guy so bad she sucked his dick twice now she's do do you get dickmatized from sucking dick what are you getting out of well i, I mean she's getting the blood out of it 
literally and figuratively, but d does this author think this is realistic in any way? Not that vampires have to be realistic, but motives and interactions should be? I don't know what any of this is. I don't know why I should care. But we're gonna keep trucking on, guys! We're just pushing through this shit. Guy confides in Ron about all this and Ron has the bright idea for them to go to the park that night and try to get this prostitution ring busted, I guess, because at this point we don't, well, they don't know that they're vampires. They didn't read the description of the book. So they call the cops. The cops show up. One of the girls that Ron knows, Anka, shows up and blows the cop who shows up. So great plan, guys. That really worked. For some reason, Ron and Guy go farther into the woods where they see a bunch of these women puking blood up into this storm drain that's just in the woods for some reason. I'm not sure why that would be there, but it is and they're crouched over it, throwing up. They don't know at the time that it's blood, but they are throwing up blood into this storm drain. Make of that what you will. Then they get chased by some large creature in the woods that they describe as a gorilla, an ape, Bigfoot. They don't know what it is. They just know it's something big and hulking that's in the woods. And this gets me thinking that a vampire gorilla would improve this story greatly. Or maybe not. But it might be fun. It can't be any worse than this garbage. They go back to Guy's house and Cheyenne has shown up there. Guy wants Ron to scare her, but Ron is such a dumpster fire of a person that his idea of scaring her is bashing her in the head with a shovel. This is when they discover that she is some form of vampire. They see the teeth in this concentric circle around her mouth like a lamprey. And Ron's instinctive reaction to this is to shove her down and decapitate her with the shovel. As you do. We get this whole scene of her head coming off and these spaghetti, bloody spaghetti-like tendrils coming out of her neck stomp and waving around because I don't know what these vampires are exactly because this is a real weird description of them that could be cool in the hands of a better writer but here it's just weird and confusing. So Guy leaves Ron to dispose of the body and Ron doesn't want to take any responsibility for it. He thinks, how the fuck is it my fault? All he'd done was try to help his friend deal with the psycho hooker and then everything had gone very tells from the crypt on him. So there is our first gratuitous pop culture reference, tells from the crypt, a very timely reference in 2021. It's fine. I can't actually say anything about that because I reference Tales from the Crypt constantly. I love it. So I hate having that in common with Ron, but also, you know, this actually could be a storyline on Tales from the Crypt. They loved their goddamn vampires. But after Ron quits thinking about Tales from the Crypt, he pervs on the dead body of Cheyenne, thinking about her shapely legs, proving that Ron will leave no opportunity to be disgusting by the wayside. So the next day, Guy goes out into the woods to look in this storm drain that the women were puking into, and he takes the opportunity to be terrible to a homeless man. He doesn't have time to waste talking to a homeless man. Then Ron shows up and continues to be horrible to the homeless man. But then the homeless guy throws a tin can at Ron and hits him in the head. So I think he's the real MVP of this story. Team homeless dude. So there's, I guess, the second thing I like about this book. A homeless man throwing a can into Ron's head. That's a whole two things in the win column. Way to go. Our next gratuitous pop culture reference is John Wick for some reason. Pop culture references on their own aren't a bad thing, but they're just obnoxious the way they're done here. Maybe half the pop culture references in this book don't make a lot of sense the way they're worked in. They're just shoved in there with no nuance or grace. 
For instance, this one is, silence hung there between them awkwardly. In all the time he'd known Ron, the only time they were ever silent together was if they were watching a great movie like John Wick, and there was just no room for talking during all that ass-kicking. Who writes like that? Who, who thinks like that? Who talks like that to their friends? This is so obnoxious and unnatural, and I hate it. Much like everything but, so far, two things in the book, I hate everything else. So then Ron and Guy bond over the needle-like vampire bites on their dicks. Vampire dick bite brothers. Woo! They finally put it together that the women were throwing up blood into the storm drain and also that Ron probably passed out from blood loss and that Diggle's heart attack was probably caused from blood loss. So that's quite a bit for them to figure out in these three short paragraphs here. So good for them not being complete idiots, I guess. So after this revelation, they go to see this guy named Chuck, who was apparently the guy who originally told Diggles about the vampire sex worker dick sucking in the park, whatever. And he tells them that no, they're not vampires. They're not human, but they're also not vampires. And then he tells them about all this research he's done into leeches and lampreys. Look, get as technical as you want here. Go off with your zoological bullshit here. These are vampires. I don't care what Chuck says. Fucking call them vampires. Chuck has come up with this explanation for how these not vampire vampires have evolved. This is like super evolution. Think about it. These things wouldn't live long once we knew about them, right? We'd hunt them into extinction. So they evolved the circular rows of teeth, and now not only are they safe from us, we're paying them to suck us dry. It's genius. Is it, Chuck? Is it? How, how does this make sense? How does this make any sense? Why would they evolve teeth like that? That makes them more noticeable than just these little vampire fangs. Why have only the female vampires evolved this way? Because, spoilers, there's a male vampire who has regular vampire fangs. Why didn't the males need to evolve that way? Are there no gay vampires? Are none of the boy vampires sucking dick? Why did the female vampires evolve teeth perfect for dick sucking? How is that more inconspicuous than regular vampire teeth? Tell me, Chuck. Tell me. I'll wait. I'm waiting. I'm waiting, Chuck. Tell me. Fucking tell me. So then Chuck name drops Fox Mulder, X-Files. Again, I'll, I'll mention X-Files everywhere. I love it, but I hate Chuck for this reference, so. So, fuck you, Chuck. You get Fox Mulder's name out your mouth this very instant. So, in a passage surprising to no one who's been following along this far, Chuck drops a homophobic slur. But what is a surprise is this is apparently a step too far for Ron. I mean, misogyny, ableist slurs, that's all totally cool. But you drop a homophobic slur on Guy and Ron and you have gone too far. Even though there's really no reason to, I guess the guilt is just getting to Guy. So he tells Joanna, who I just realized I think I've been referring to as Joanne this whole time. It's Joanna. There's an A on the end. He tells Joanna that he cheated on her, but before he can give her details that, well, it was just oral, the male vampire of the story breaks through the kitchen door. It's called the kitchen door. I think they mean the back door, but okay, the kitchen door, and kidnaps Joanna. So we do get the knowledge here that yes, there are male vampires, and no, they have not evolved like the females to suck dick. Just regular ass vampire fangs. He tells Guy to bring him his whore by tomorrow or he'll keep Guy's whore, which is of course going to be a problem because he's referring to Cheyenne who is very dead right now. Guy shows up at Ron's place to tell him what's happened and tells him that he's seen the gorilla. So this hulking black male vampire is who they've been referring to as a gorilla and an ape. Just a little light racism for you there. Which leads into a passage that I will never not be confused by. 
So Guy tells Ron that he looked like a black Dwayne Johnson with vampire teeth. Who, asked Ron? The Rock, said Guy. The... He... He looked like a black version of The Rock, who famously is black and Samoan. What... What is this supposed to mean? Does he mean darker skinned? Is... Moving on, they go and tell Chuck about this and about the vampire who is the black version of Dwayne Johnson. And Chuck says that, yeah, it figures he has regular vampire teeth. The males wouldn't evolve. What? Why not, Chuck? Why not? Explain this to me. Why wouldn't they evolve to have dick sucking teeth? The author apparently thinks that Chuck is a witty character because we get this from Chuck. Hey, you gotta take the dick out of your mouth if you want me to understand you. See what I did there? I nullified your argument by implying that I couldn't hear you because of the dick in your mouth. It is that supposed to be witty? Like, is it? Oh god, we're, we're gonna move through the last 40% of this book as quickly as possible. The Matrix is referenced. Chuck says, that ain't fucking cool, man. And Ron says, neither was making a sequel to The Matrix. Bad shit happens. It's 2021, so... <sighs> Is he referring to the second Matrix movie that came out shortly after the first? Or is he referring to the most recent one? Who talks like this? <laughs> Who talks like this? Who? Who is having these conversations? Are the people in the author's life talking like this? Because if so, I feel bad for the guy. His friends are fucking obnoxious if these are the conversations they're having. So Ron has blackmailed Chuck into helping them by claiming he buried part of Cheyenne's corpse at his house or something. I don't know. I don't know if that actually happened or if he's just talking shit. So Chuck in turn enlists this guy he knows that, who he calls Pops and apparently he hates being called that but we don't get any other name for him so we're we're calling him Pops. And he's this hardened old guy. I kind of picture Lance Henriksen if we're like fan casting this. God, I am not a fan of this book, but if we're if we're casting an imaginary movie version of this. I kind of picture Lance Henriksen, although I wouldn't wish this shit show on him. He doesn't deserve this. Confusingly, when Pops shows up at Chuck's door, he knocks whimsically. A whimsical knock on the door drew their attention. Nothing about this character indicates that he would knock in a whimsical manner or do anything in a whimsical manner. What is a whimsical knock? Is it like shaving a haircut? What is a whimsical knock in this context? So after Pop shows up, I briefly kind of like the character, but that's ruined pretty quick. The character doesn't use the ableist arsler himself. This time it's actually the author using it because we're not in anyone's perspective. It's not dialogue. He just says that Pops looks at Guy like he's retarded and that's the author. I could maybe let the others slide because they were always dialogue or in a character's perspective so maybe that character is just a shitty person who would use terms like this. This is the author. So even though they don't know if these are like stereotypical movie vampires, they decide to wait for daytime before going down into the sewers after them. They get attacked by one of the female lamprey vampires. Lam lampires? Should we call them lampires? They get attacked by one of them, Pops blows its head off, and then asks if it was a wombat because <laughs> Pops doesn't know what a wombat looks like and Chuck told him they were hunting wombats because what the fuck was he gonna say? Vampires? So the whole wombat thing kind of does make me laugh, so we've added one more thing to the positive column, I suppose. It's so surrounded by all this other terrible stuff, though, it barely makes a blip on the radar. They decide to split up in the sewers and we get another exchange where Chuck once again shows off his witty, witty dialogue. This is witty dialogue, you guys. So Ron says it's a terrible idea to split up. Why the fuck would they split up? Chuck says, I'll tell you why, because fuck you. 
See what I did there? I nullified your argument by putting fuck you at the end of my sentence. Ron thinks about how everything he knows about sewers, he's learned from horror movies, he title drops, for some reason the remake of The Blob, and Return of the Living Dead 3. I, I am 0% surprised that Ron only knows sequels and remakes. Uh, Ron and Chuck are gross and misogynistic again. Big surprise. Ron, Ron tells Chuck that if he wants a girl's opinion, he'll ask it while he's behind her buried six inches deep. That's the only time you can trust a woman's judgment. Obviously, that's disgusting, but I also don't even understand the logic there, so it fails on every metric you can come up with. Chuck predictably asks, six inches, is that all you got? And Ron's like, yeah, I only put it in halfway, so they can both fucking die, I don't care. They get attacked by another vampire, Lampire. <laughs> so Ron shoots her in the face and then tells Chuck, see what I did there? I nullified her argument by shooting her in the face. I guess it's the rule of threes. That's that I nullified your argument thing. This is the third time it's been used and it sucked the first two times, but this third time it's actually pretty funny. I hate that I find it funny this time, but good for you. You genuinely made me laugh this time. One more thing in the positives column, I suppose. Oh, but then it's immediately ruined by Chuck saying, oh, big deal, it was just a chick, and Ron literally smiling at the misogyny and saying, you know, you're starting to grow on me. Of course, they're, they're bonding over how much they hate women, you guys. It's so sweet. Take all the things I put in the positive column out. I don't want any, I don't want anything in the positive column now. They, they're hateful incels. I don't care if fucking Ron is married. He's an incel. Fuck him. So then we cut over to Pops and Guy, and there's some weird noise down the tunnel they're going, and we get this, frankly, bizarre description of this sound. A strange keening sound rose slowly in the distance, like the moaning of a dozen women in unison as they copulated with wolves. Guy wasn't sure why that's what he thought of when he heard it, but there it was. Yeah, I'm not sure why that's what you think of when you hear it either, Guy. I'm not sure anyone would think of that. Why would that be a thing anyone would think of upon hearing any noise? Women fucking wolves. Moving on. So they come across Joanna and she's tied up in this tunnel. They rescue her. She has bites on her neck from these vampires. So again, it's pounded home that they could just be sucking blood the normal vampire way. They don't have to be sucking dick in the park. I guess women just want to suck dick in the park. Why get your blood from the neck when you could just suck off some guy's sweaty crotch? They evolved that way. It's evolution. You can't argue with evolution. So our two groups who have split up find each other again in the sewers. A group of these vampires close in on them, and in describing them, the author uses the slur for the Romani people, because it's 2021, and of course we don't fucking know that's a slur. It is. Don't use it. Of course, this far, 81% of the way through this book, I can't expect this author to be enlightened or sensitive or anything in any way. We're gonna get through the rest of this book. We are gonna get through it. So the black vampire version of The Rock shows up and he lets Joanna leave with Ron and pulls Guy in for a little chat where he's actually being pretty reasonable and saying like, yeah, Cheyenne had these obsessive tendencies and I don't blame you for protecting your household. You did what you had to do. She was a defective daughter, and she was an outlier. What she did is not their way. They're peaceful. They peacefully coexist by sucking dick in the park. Also, this would be the point to connect 
Diggle's wife's death with Cheyenne, but the book doesn't do it. The characters don't do it. It's left to the reader to do it, which is a pretty simple thing to do. You don't necessarily need everything spelled out, but with the poor quality of this book, I'm just left to think the author forgot about it. Oh, apparently the black vampire version of the rock's name is actually Dragutin. The, the author is kind enough to give us a phonetic explanation of how to say it. Anyway, Dragutin tells Guy that they're free to go as long as Guy and his friends don't tell anyone about the vampires. So he agrees to this and we should be cool, right? Everything's fine now. They start to leave out the sewers the vampire women move aside and let them go. But then out of nowhere, Dragutine just pops up and rips Chuck's head off. And my notes just say, yay. Dragutine must have known what an absolute piece of shit Chuck is because Chuck hasn't done anything to him. But he just pops up and rips his head off. So as my notes say, yay. So Dragutine starts to say, this makes us even, which fair, okay, but Pops ruins it by shooting at him. So Pops shoots at Dragutine, misses him, and Dragutine, of course, tells the other vampires to kill them all. So that went well. They run through the sewers, shooting at the vampires, and Pops, who from time to time in this book I like, I don't like him right here. He gets very racist and drops a couple slurs. Not cool, Pops. They end up running into this weird chamber that has this blobby, gelatinous creature the size of a minivan in it. And this is very clearly the thing that the vampire women were throwing up blood to down through the sewer grate. This thing is never explained, except that the vampires are very protective of it, so I don't know if it's their pet or their god or what it actually is. It's not explained. They start yelling at our human group of absolute fuckwits not to harm the... they have a name for it. They call it a Svet... Svetovid? I probably butchered that. I don't know if that's a real thing or what? I, I guess I could have googled it, but I'm not making any extra work for myself delving into this book more than I absolutely have to to make this video for you guys. Because I love you and I love talking about stupid, terrible books. So Guy and Pops find this ladder that goes up to the grating and then Ron shows up topside to help them move this grate out of the way because it's really heavy or stuck or something. At some point while they're shooting and fighting the vampires and this blob creature, which isn't actually doing anything because it's just a big dumb blob thing, um, Guy runs out of ammo in his gun and just chucks the gun at the vampires like he thinks he's in the naked gun or something. So that's fun. That that might be another thing that actually kind of made me laugh a little. Pops had a grenade on him that he throws down into the chamber to blow up the vampires, so that works to some degree. However, Dragutine is still alive, so Guy shoots him with the shotgun and Ron and Pops help fight him off. Pops throws dynamite down into this chamber, so that's a good time. Why did he have that? Well, because apparently he couldn't decide between the dynamite and the grenade, so he just brought them both. As you do when hunting wombats. Wombats are cute, by the way. They're super cute. If he had actually been hunting wombats, I'd be way more angry with him. So in the wrap up of this, we find out Ron's wife left him. Good for her. Good for her. My notes say good for her. Ron says, it's cool. It's the best part of his week, actually. So Guy can't tell if he means it or if he's just putting on a brave face. And then he thinks that knowing Ron, he probably meant it. Ron is so likable. 
everyone wants to be his friend. Likeable. 2021. <laughs> that one doesn't apply here. I'm sorry. But our last passage with Ron and Guy is, there was a brief moment of silence before Ron spoke again. You know those real dolls? The life-size sex dolls? Even after what we've all been through, Ron still has time to bring up the stupid shit, thought Guy. If he wasn't so weary, he would have been impressed. Yeah, he said, but in a way that let Ron know he didn't want to know where this was going. Just, just fucking tell him to shut up then, Guy. You don't have to li- You don't like Ron. You, you cannot convince me you are friends. You hate this guy. Nowhere does it appear that you like this man. As usual, Ron didn't care. Why? Likeable. Likeable. Everyone wants to be his friend. Think if I buy one and I cut its head off and fuck that? Do you think that'd be weird? Yeah, Ron. Yeah, that's, that's weird. Ron would never change, thought Guy. Honestly, he didn't think he'd want him to. He shook his head and smiled, and Ron smiled back. Are we supposed to like these characters? Seriously. Seriously, are we supposed to find them likable? Are we supposed to want to hang out with them? Are we supposed to want to fight vampires with them? I hate them. I hate them so much. Okay, we're almost done. We're almost done here, okay? I... Oh my god. We're almost done. We should be done here. But then the author wants to torture us with an epilogue. This, this epilogue can kiss my ass, honestly. Basically, it's another park... Another random dude getting his dick sucked in the front of his truck. Is it a truck? Ugh. Who gives a fuck? Yeah, it's a Ford F-150. So he's getting his dick sucked in the front seat of his truck. We're obviously supposed to think it's one of these vampires because the girl uses some teeth. And then we find out, no, no, she's just some college girl he'd picked up at a bar. What's the point? It, is her name Jennifer? He couldn't remember. Okay. Who who gives a fuck? What was the point of this epilogue? This stupid fake-out epilogue that is wasting my time can kiss my fucking ass. I'm done. We're done. Okay, that's... that's... we're done. That's the end of the book. That's the end of the book. We made it, guys. We made it. I think this is the longest video on my channel so far. We're, we're done. The book's over. The video's not over because I have some stats here, okay? This book, 125 pages, so at the very least, it's short. In those 125 pages, the word blowjob is used 15 times. Cock is used seven times. Dick is used 28 times. Penis is eight times. Crotch, three times. I control f the fuck out of this book, you guys. The word hooker is used 25 times. Whore is five times. Prostitute is six times. So I guess at the very least we can take some comfort in the knowledge that the worst of those three was used the least number of times. As you might expect, the term sex worker is never used. That's just not something this author is aware he should be saying, I guess. I'm not surprised the characters don't know to say that because they're terrible people, but when we're just in narration, he's still saying the terrible things in his own narrative voice. So that's it, guys. I'm completely unfamiliar with this author. Apparently, he's made some movies for Lionsgate and some independent movies and written a nonfiction book in celebration of the Halloween holiday. I'm not familiar with him. Apparently, other people are because I choose to believe the glowing Goodreads and Amazon reviews for this book have to be from his small circle of fans and possibly friends and family because that's the only way I can justify the four and five star ratings for this book. I, I gave it one star. I might give it one and a half just for it making me laugh a few times. But yeah, I would not recommend reading this unless you've got 125 pages worth of time to spare. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. It is only 99 cents on Kindle. It's free if you have Kindle Unlimited, at least at the time of this recording. 
if you want to waste your time, go ahead. You might get something more out of this shit show than I did, except a few laughs. I did get a few laughs, so it wasn't time completely wasted. On a side note, after I read this book, I started getting some really fucked up recommendations from Amazon, and one of them was for this book I'll put up here. It's called Gobbler, Fuck Your Thanksgiving. It's on Kindle Unlimited. I could read it. Let me know, guys. Should I read it? Should I read it and review it for you? Let me know in the comments. And again, if you've stuck with me this long through this absolute hot garbage dumpster fire of a book, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Give me a like, give me some interaction. It really lets the algorithm know that people want to see this and it shows it to more people that way. And like I said at the top, um, I really fear that the algorithm isn't going to show this to a lot of people because of all the because of my cat losing her mind, because of all the vampire dick sucking, blowjobs, marital rape, apology, everything, everything in this book that I have had to say with my own mouth. So just let the algorithm know that it's okay for me to say these things. You don't mind, cause you're cool like that. Thank you for watching. Don't read this book. <laughs> My cat agrees. Don't read this book. I appreciate you. Have a great day. Free from vampires. Free from these vampires. Go find some cool vampires to hang out with. Fuck this book. Thank you.